Hey there, Kazen here, and welcome back to Always Doing. Today I have my first wrap-up for you guys. It's going to be my August 2018 wrap-up. It's not going to be the whole month though. I read nine books over the course of the month, I think eight or nine, and I'm just going to wrap up the last four, partly for my memory, partly for my sanity. Anyway, let's get into it. <laughs> The first book is The Andromeda Strain by Michael Crichton. I'd seen Crichton before, I've seen ER, I've seen, you know, Jurassic Park, but I've never read him before. I decided to start here because it's a medical sci-fi thriller and I love everything medicine. And he was a doctor, so he knows what he's talking about. First, the plot. In the late 60s, the US government is looking for the next great weapon. They think it'll be biological or chemical, so they put these satellites up into orbit and let them go around for a few days, and they're hoping that while in orbit, it will catch some kind of bacteria or some kind of microorganism that they can then weaponize and use back on Earth. The first few missions do not go well. More often than not, the bacteria they find is the bacteria they sent it up with because they didn't, you know, clean it as well as they should have. But this time, a satellite has come back, and when they go to pick it up, everyone in the town where they found it is dead. Like, in the streets, dead. Some of them are sitting at their dinner table looking like they're having a nice time, dead. Just dead. They do manage to find two survivors, so they bring them, as well as the satellite, back to this underground bunker of sorts where they will examine the survivors and they'll examine the satellite, try and figure out what happened and make sure that it doesn't, you know, kill everybody. I really liked this book. It is very plotty. It keeps on moving. And it's not just the written narrative. Crichton throws in documents and other things. The book is almost 50 years old now, and it was interesting to see what technology holds up and what didn't. A lot of the medical technology, even today, seems pretty advanced. On the other hand, some of the computer references are, aww, mainframe, you're so cute. I like how Crichton respects the reader. In the middle of the story, he throws out hints about how this came about in the first place, and I thought at the end, like many authors, he kind of show it off, but he didn't. He let it sit. He trusted the reader to be smart enough to figure it out. It wasn't that hard. And I appreciate that. The book doesn't take itself too seriously. Like, for example, this bunker that has been built in secret in the middle of the desert has a full, complete U.S. Um, agricultural station on top of it that is completely working, trying to find barley that will grow in the desert. So if anyone came up there, they could show, oh, look, here's our barley, here's our research, having no idea that there's a huge five-story bunker underneath them in the ground. It wasn't all perfect, though. The characterization is a little thin. I think that's a result of there being so much plot. There just weren't a lot of places to slot it in. When there is characterization, it's good. There's just not a lot of it. Another thing I didn't like, full Bechdel test fail. I think there's only one named woman and she's the computerized voice. So yeah, fail. As far as I could tell, every single character was white. I wanted more diversity. And this book contains an idea. This is not a spoiler. That really annoyed me. And it's called the odd man hypothesis. And the idea, basically, is that unmarried men are the most rational, logical creatures, and if you have a life or death decision, and people are arguing about it or it's unclear, you should let the unmarried man make the decision because he is scientifically proved to be the most rational. Which, no. No. Mm-mm. Not buying it. I'm glad it's not a real thing. All in all, though, the overall plot carried me through. I really enjoyed the read. I would have finished it more quickly if I were comfortable reading it right before bed. I was afraid of my dreams turning into, you know, apocalypses. Next is The Piano Shop on the Left Bank by Thad Carhart. This is a warm hug of a nonfiction book that I was not expecting. Carhart is an American who lives in Paris and while he's walking in one day, he passes a piano tuning shop that says they also sell used pianos. And he walks in and is, hey, I, you know, I used to play piano when I was a kid. I, I would like to look at your used pianos. And the old wizened shopkeeper 
says, you know, when we get one, we'll let you know. And he comes in, you know, a couple weeks later, same thing. But one time he comes in and instead of the old shopkeeper, it's his apprentice. And his apprentice says, well, if you have, you know, a recommendation from a current customer, that might help you out. He gets his recommendation and is let into the workshop where he can see in the back, you know, open the door. It's like a magic world back there because it's chock-a-block of pianos, uprights, baby grands, grand pianos of all makes and models from all over the world. And they're all restored in this nondescript kind of hidden piano shop. This apprentice very quickly ends up becoming the owner of the shop and he is the most charming character. He shows Carhartt as well as all of us the difference between different kinds of pianos and how important it is to match a piano to its player. Will this piano be in a room where there's not a lot of space? Will children be playing it? What other can, what kind of sound do you want? There were so many considerations that I hadn't thought about when choosing a piano. This shop prides itself on matching pianos to the owners. And at first Carhartt is a bit skeptical. He has a small apartment. He knows he wants an upright. But when Luke says, this is the piano for you, and he's like, mm, but he plays it and it's, absolutely everything he wanted. The sound is as rich, the keyboard is just the right amount of responsive, and he, he ends up getting it even though it's a bit big for his living room. I thought that would be the whole arc of the book with maybe some other stuff put in, but by 15% Carhartt has already bought his piano. And there's really no main plot in the sense that there's nothing that's hanging over their head. Oh no, they're moving! Will the piano fit? There's, there's nothing so angsty or scary as that. It's just Carhartt talking about his love of pianos and interweaving it with history and information about, you know, how piano tuning is done to, you know, famous solos written for piano and composers and the relationship with piano. And it sounds like it might be disjointed and boring, but it's not. Like I said, it's a warm hug of a book. It was just so comforting to go there and know that you have all these people that love pianos. If you like music, even if you don't really care for pianos all that much, I think you'll enjoy it. Next book is a bit of a change of pace. It's Picture Perfect Cowboy by Tiffany Rice. This is an upcoming release. I got a advanced copy from 8th Circle Press, thank you. And it comes out November 5th. This is book 10 of the original Sinners series, but don't worry, it stands alone. I haven't even read all the original Sinners books. It's fine, you'll be fine. So this book is a BDSM erotic romance. Simone is a photographer. She's helping put together a charity calendar, which I think we can appreciate because it's for literacy and they get extremely muscled dudes in libraries with barely any clothes on holding a book for the calendar. It's for charity. One of the guys who is going to be in the calendar has to back out at the last minute, so he ropes his friend into doing it. His friend is a world champion bull rider who has recently retired due to an injury. He's a modest guy. He was brought up fairly conservatively, but he still manages to disrobe and Simone takes his picture. And while they're talking, while they're bantering, they find out they really like each other. And Simone, instead of deciding to go back to New York immediately, ends up extending her stay and staying at his house so they can get to know each other and romance, etc. This book rests on a flipped trope. Often in BDSM romance, you have a experienced dom showing a baby sub the waves. But here, Simone is a professional submissive and Jason is the one that thinks he might be dominant but hasn't acted on those desires yet. We learn that it has to do with his upbringing and all of those family issues end up being central to the conflict of the book. I love Rice. I love her writing. I love her characters. If you've read any of the original Sinners books, you will love that there is a um, cameo from Nora and Surin as well in here. If you don't know them, that's okay. It won't matter. There are some nice moments and some nice representation in here as well. We have own voices by sexual rep. And as in all of her books, it's sex positive and guilt negative. Jason carries around a lot of guilt from his upbringing and Simone helps him realize that as long as everything is fully consented and everyone is having fun, there's a whole range of things you can do while having sex that can make it a 
better experience for everyone. If I have any quibbles, it's that it's a 200 page book. It's a category length romance. I want to see her writing, you know, 360 page standalones every single time, but I'll take what I can get. And one more book, London War Notes by Molly Panter Downs. This is nonfiction. Panter Downs was a woman who lived in and around London during World War II. She wrote weekly columns for The New Yorker, and those columns are what's assembled in this book. It's not all of them, it's a selection, and it comes out to roughly one column for every two weeks during World War II, from just before the war really breaks out through VE Day. I'm not a big war person. I don't like reading about, you know, tactics and fronts and strategies quite so much, but I'm always up for reading about people's experiences, especially on the home front during the war, and that's what this is. We get to see London prepare for a blitz, undergo the blitz, what everyone's mood was during that time, how they reacted to, you know, stricter rations or the thought that they may not have enough coal for the winter. These little details are were some of my favorite parts. The idea that there were blackout deaths because during the blackout you couldn't, you know, have a flashlight as you were walking outside and that would lead to situations where people would, you know, have an accident and, and die. I, I never thought of that as a possible thing. What makes the book though is Panter Down's writing. She is witty, she notices detail, and it really brings the atmosphere to life. As a quick example, while London was preparing for the Blitz, a lot of businesses would put sandbags in front just to protect the facade, and she noticed that the most chic store in all of London had painted their sandbags the same color as their facade and that everyone enjoyed that and thought that was the best. She was able to find some humor in the situation as well and I enjoyed it as a look behind, kind of behind the scenes at what it was like in London during World War II. I will say it's a bit thick. I actually had a physical copy of this book. It's by Persephone. If you don't know Persephone, they do reprints of books by mostly by women authors that have been lost to time, basically, have gone out of print. I'm really thankful that they did that with her work. I had to read it in parts, though. I could read maybe a month or two worth of articles at a time, and then I had to put it down. But that didn't take away from the experience at all, even though it took me a month to get through it, which is a long time for me. So if you have any interest in World War II homefront kind of stuff, first-person accounts especially, that's a catnip for me, I highly recommend it. So there we have it, my first wrap up. Have you read any of these books? Are you interested in reading any of them now? Go ahead, let's have a chat down in the comments and go ahead and subscribe if you like what you see and I will see you in my next video. Bye.